Hey, uh, where are we going next? We're going to go to our pediatric area now. Now we had talked about doing our best to recreate the clinical environment. We really want the learner to come in here and to feel like they are in an area where they would be providing care for their particular patient. And so we've done what we can with our limited resources. And you can see on the side here, we have two of these vertical towers that we call sea lockers. And sea lockers can contain different equipment that's used for patient care, and it's all labeled. So you can see this is a canister for suction here. We have feeding tubes. We have gloves. We have all these different supplies. And this is organized exactly the same as it is organized in the hospital. So that when somebody learns where something is here, say they're having a problem, they're just trying to suction a patient, they need a new suction canister, they know that it's in the top right of this particular sea locker. Well, when they're in the clinical environment and they have a similar need, it's going to be in exactly the same place. Now, did the medical profession organize all of this for every operating room? So doctors, or, or is this something that's unique to your facility? Uh, it's certainly not unique to our facility, but it's not common to all facilities either. When we started this four years ago, uh, we were on the cutting edge as far as medical schools incorporating simulation into their curricula. Mm -hmm. Now, by far the majority, if not every single medical school, has some variety of simulation center. Not all of them have bought into the idea of trying to have something that's exactly like the clinical environment. Some of them just utilize a simulator that they will take either to the real clinical environment or they just have a room and they'll focus mainly on the physiology and those things and not so much on the communication patterns and professionalism. Okay, if we were in a situation like this and you presented an emergency where the baby's heart stopped beating, would you have the equipment in this simulation room where you could restart that baby's heart? Yes, we would. And so if that were the issue, uh, the patient would come in Lots of times we will have people who will be playing the role of a parent or a bystander to add more realism to be appropriately hysterical mm -hmm. uh, and to build up the energy in the room as it were. If the patient were to present to the emergency department, you would want to first of all not get hooked by the anesthesia machine. I wanted to let our audience know that uh, Dr. Denmark did spend some time in emergency medicine. Uh, how how long correct. were you involved in emergency medicine? I still work in the pediatric emergency department and have been working there for since 1997, so 12 years. So boy, the students have lots of experienced people around. We do. We try to provide that for them. So if this particular patient were to present without uh, breathing, we would first of all be applying oxygen we would then be placing them on the monitor and hooking them up to the monitor, which is not on currently. Mm -hmm. But that would show the heart rate and the blood pressure and the oxygen level. And once that was connected, we would then determine if there was more invasive measures that needed to be taken. One of the things we did in the anesthesia room uh, was we showed you how to put, take a breathing tube out and put a breathing tube in. And if this particular patient were not breathing well, then we would need to perform that procedure for them. If their heart had stopped or was slow and required a shock, we would take too many machines in one space, but we would take these paddles, which you've seen on TV, mm -hmm. and we would apply them to the patient. And if this were on, I would never hold them in the same hand. That was a horrible illustration right there. Mm -hmm. But we would take them and place them on the patient with a normal size collar over the heart and you're placing them over the top of the heart up here and then over the bottom of the heart and you're trying to deliver an electrical current through the heart's wiring to restart mm -hmm. it and so we try to get as close to that space as we can so we try to have it since the electrical activity goes from basically your right shoulder down towards your left hip we do our best to position the paddles, and so the first paddle will be up here by the right shoulder. Mm -hmm. The second paddle will be down here, almost in the, just below the armpit, and then we would deliver a shock to hopefully restart the heart. Now, the uh, amount of energy you send through those panels, would it be different for someone like me and then this baby? That's correct. Mm -hmm. For anybody less than adult size, so once you're about the middle of adolescence, then 
we start to base the energy based on weight below that. Mm -hmm. And so it would be so many joules per kilogram. If a patient came in and was unconscious and we didn't know how much they weighed, there are ways of measuring that based on height. And so we actually have a board down in the emergency department that we will lay down on the gurney and based on that height, it will give us a rough estimate of the weight and then we would calculate how much energy was required based on that weight to deliver adequate energy to restart the heart. And that's why they call it a science. That is incredible. Well, I want to uh, follow you to our next room. Okay, excellent. And what do we have here, Dr. Denmark? Well, this room is in transition at the moment. Usually we use this for Noel and Lupe. Noel and Lupe are our two obstetric simulators. And they are used to simulate birthing a baby. As you can see, we have this very tiny little newborn baby here. Now he comes with some extra features in that he can electronically be attached to his mother here and to the piston that sits up in her abdominal cavity. And with this, he is then pushed out through the birth canal. And we can have him come out normally, which would be face down and then rotate as he comes through the birth canal. We can have him come out sunny side up, which would be backwards and it's a little bit more difficult delivery. Or, if you see he has this little cap here, we can actually pop that out, and there's a similar connector to this. We can actually have him deliver feet first through the birth canal, which is a much more difficult delivery, mm -hmm. and very important that the people who are providing care know exactly how to do that. And so in a simulated environment, excuse me, I'm going to lift your gown for one second here, Noelle. She has this abdominal cavity, that we can move off to the side. And you can see here's the connector that would connect in this case down between the baby's legs and then this piston here would slowly push him or her out through the birth canal and all the, that the learner sees when her abdomen is reconnected here is they would see what looks like a normal birth canal enlarging as the baby's head comes up and then they would practice delivering the baby. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have Lupe uh, who has the same features as Noel and the babies that go with them. And then we also have simulated placentas and umbilical cords. And so when the baby delivers, uh, the placenta is usually still up within the birth canal. And so you need to provide gentle traction on the umbilical cord so that the placenta is delivered so that the mother doesn't have any complications from that. And so we can simulate that as well. Mm -hmm. Now this is actually one of our more expensive simulators. He's not a very attractive looking fellow at all. Mm -hmm. um, but some of the features that he has, some of them have to do with physiology and his programming that's not easily demonstrated. But if you can just touch his skin here, Bob, you can feel that he has a much more pliable feel uh, it's softer. Oh, that's unbelievable. That's like real skin. You're not going to confuse it with the real skin, but it's certainly much more than, say, Noel, who's over here, who's more of a hard plastic, almost a Barbie doll-like oh, feel. Oh, yeah. What a difference. And so the price difference between them, it's basically double for him. And a lot of that has to do with the technology for the skin uh, and its ability to, ex to expand and contract based on whatever is going on with his particular scenario. And so he is one of the guys that has been developed in conjunction with the military and the Department of Defense. He is also wireless, and so the troops can practice carrying him around as if you were an injured soldier. Mm. They can have a leg be missing or some other traumatic event and need to provide care for him and practice those sorts of things. And so he is a, he's a good guy who serves a purpose. Well, that is incredible. I want to thank you very much for the video portion of this interview. And this is Bob Barboza, Kids Talk Radio and Junior Medical School, signing off.